test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Dean Roper from Wanifra. Welcome today. We're uh, just about to get started. We're going, we're going to give it another minute or two so everybody can join. So just uh, sit tight, and we will be starting in just about one minute. Thanks. Okay, hi everybody. This is uh, Dean Roper from Wanifra. Welcome to today's Wanifra webinar. Uh, today we're talking about gender diversity in the newsroom, uh, best practice at Agora. Um, and our featured panelist speaker today is Susanna Ziomeka. She is the founder and editor in chief of News Mavens. Um, and uh, I will be moderating this uh, webinar. Of course, women in news and gender diversity has been a huge topic, uh, in, in, not just the news media, but around the world in the last few years. And uh, we're thrilled to actually uh, not just do this web webinar, but to be very active in this issue uh, as an organization, but also uh, to push this issue within the industry. And one of our initiatives we have is a Women in News which uh, has been in, in we've, we, we initiated this, uh, this program years ago. Uh, and, and one aspect of that is we have a Women in News Summit, which is a part of our world annual World News Media Congress. And this year it's taking place in Estoro, Portugal, which is uh, just outside of Lisbon uh, on June 6th. Uh, it's a fantastic summit. Uh, it's a place where not just women, but others gather uh, journalists, editors, business, uh, business executive CEOs come to talk about m many issues surrounding this topic. There are no filters in that, in that uh, event. Uh, I highly encourage you uh, to attend and especially to consider coming to our Congress as well. Next slide, please. Also, uh, two years ago, our Women in News uh, initiative uh, produced this report called Winning Strategies, Creating Stronger News Media Organizations by Increasing Gender Diversity. It features 10 case studies uh, of a number of news organizations around the world that have prioritized gender equality. Um, if you just can go to that link there, uh, you can download the report. It's for free. Uh, or just go to our web page, a website, and click on Insights, Research Reports, and you can find it there. Also, uh, as um, Susanna is the Editor-in-Chief of News Mavens, maybe you've heard a little bit about it. I think she's going to tell us a bit about it today. But news Mavens was launched, I believe, in late September of last year. It's a, it's a really interesting initiative that was driven by Agora uh, and by Susanna to create a curated site uh, run or pu published by female editors all over Europe. And the hypothesis is more or less to see what the news that comes from the site, what is the narrative that is produced compared to, say, a traditional newsroom by like old white men like me. Okay, so without further ado, uh, our featured speaker is again Susanna Ziomeka. And Susanna, if you're there, I hope you, uh, I'm not butchering your last name, and I hope I don't uh, do the same to uh, uh, some of the other titles within, within Agora. 
so Susanna is the editor of News Maidens. But she's also she before that she was the editorial director for the for Wysoski Obstasy. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Please correct me later. And uh, but she has been actively involved <clears throat> in pushing the the issue of gender diversity within Agora. But I think as she will tell you, Agora itself has since its uh, in, inception has has uh, been strong on this issue. And uh, it's, it's a great uh, publication, great media company to talk about this. Uh, but before we get started with Suzanne, I want to encourage everybody uh, listening to try to participate in the webinar. And how you can do that is to send your questions for Susanna as she's talking. On your right-hand panel, panel, there's a uh, one area it says questions there. You click on there and then you can type in any questions and we will try to get to them and pose those to Susanna after her presentation. So without further ado, we are going to welcome Susanna, who I believe is in Warsaw. She'll tell us in a minute. So Susanna, it's all yours. Welcome. Hi. I hope everyone can hear me. I am indeed in Warsaw. And my first tip and language hack that I'm going to share with you today is how to pronounce, successfully pronounce, strange Polish words. And what I propose you try the next time you're looking at my last name or the name of the publication that I was digital editor for for, the, for a few years is to say them with an Italian accent. So looking at my last name, that would be Jometska. And suddenly, <laughs> You're hitting the right accents. Uh, the name, yeah, great. Now try it with Visokia. Visokia. Come on, Dean. There you go. Uh, and the second word is Obsasi. Obsasi. And that is the name of the publication I worked for um, before launching News Mavens. And I wanted to start um, our time together today with a little a little background about where this newspaper came from. Um, Gazeta Wyborcza was actually founded in a very different way than most newspapers come to life. Most newspapers are the brainchild of a business concept and an editorial concept. Usually somebody with money meets someone with uh, a passion for sharing information they come together and they create a news organization. It didn't happen that way with Gazeta Wyborcza. What happened here was that history forced a group of uh, social activists to take on the role of early journalists. Back when um, martial law began and the solidarity movement was growing in Poland, um, in opposition to the communist regime, a number of journalists flocked to the protests to feed real information around the, pro the government propaganda machine and through alternate channels so that people in, uh, all over the country could know what was happening in the shipyards. And that meant that there was alternative distribution channels mainly through the Catholic Church, and there was actually uh, a printed um, underground press. And after the communist regime fell and Poland was gearing up for its first democratic elections, it became clear that you can't really have a democracy without an independent media to support it. People need to know who is running. They need to understand what the program is. They need to get to know the candidates so that they can make informed democratic choices. And so these same journalists that were involved in informing the public about the strikes decided to get together and create the first independent newspaper. They called it the election paper because the purpose of it was to support the first democratic elections. That is literally what Gazeta newspaper, the Borcha election means. And so this was in effect uh, a business concept that was grown entirely out of the product side. It was an editorial brainchild. And what that means is that 
um, the, the founding group uh, led by Adam Michnik um, looked to the West because for the entirety of, the, of these founding fathers' lives, the only media that they were in contact with was the government propaganda machine and Radio Free Europe or whatever was brought back from the West. And so this ideal of a Western liberal newspaper became a benchmark for Gazeta Viborcha. And what they used actually more than, I mean, of course, they, 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 they looked at formats, they looked at fonts, um, they looked at organizational structure. But one of the most impressive feats, I think, um, of that early group was that they also looked at values. And when they looked at the underlying values that Western liberal democratic news, independent newspapers had, is it seemed to these Polish journalists that they had this underlying dedication to supporting of women's rights. And in, in order to uh, somehow address and facilitate this need, on the left here on the screen, I'm sorry about the proportions, I created the wrong proportion slides and now they're a bit thinner and longer than they should be, but you get the idea. On the left you see the first, the very first front page of Gazeta Wyborcza um, back in early 80s with Lech Wałęsa, Lech Wałęsa, not to be pronounced Lech Wałęsa, Lech Wałęsa, the leader of the Solidarity Movement, is on the front page. He was also running for president. And on the right, you see Wysokie Obcasy. Wysokie Obcasy was the, the Gazeta Wyborcza's answer to what they perceived as a dedication to women's equal rights in Western media. And what they did was they created a title it, called Wysokie Obcasy, which was actually a weekly magazine. Like Time, like Newsweek, Wysokie Obcasy deals with current events and investigative reporting and in-depth analysis and human interest stories, but it is created from women's perspectives and mainly by women authors. The, the main editorial team is also women and there is a clear kind of ideological feminist foundation underlying the magazine. And this became a supplement um, to every weekend edition of Gazeta Wyborcza. So you can, you can imagine just try to imagine what that would do. You have a weekly magazine that doesn't have to use its cover to sell copies because it's being distributed with every issue of the weekend um, newspaper anyway. And this, this kind of guaranteed distribution, guaranteed reach gave this, particularly this early team, a lot of comfort in creating the kind of magazine that would it would be rather non-conformist on, on an ideological level. So what they did back then, on the very first cover of the Sokyo Obsasa, they put Lady President Clinton. This was 19 years ago. Um, we were all hoping that this cover was prophetic with regard to the last US elections. However, that did not turn out to be the case. But Obsasa have allowed themselves to explore women's issues in a very broad range of approaches. And the cover strategy, I think, is a great way of exemplifying how they did this. Basically, there is a mix, a very mixed strategy between showing well-known artists like Zadie Smith, um, local artists like the woman on the left, um, uh, women from who are who are fighting for social justice in various parts of the world whose faces are not known but whose causes are common and align with the mission of the um, the paper the magazine and on the far right you see this kind of lecherous figure whoops need to wreck this lecherous figure he's a gynecologist and this was the cover a cover that dealt with um, that showcased a big investigative report inside that dealt with women's abuse at um, the doctor's office. So it's a combination of celebrating women who are wildly successful, um, building the 
the fame and the clout of women who are doing important things who are not well known but should be, celebrating ordinary women who do extraordinary things, and dealing with um, and dealing with common issues that women all over Poland and the world are confronted with in their daily lives. And it took, I keep going to that slide, um, sorry. And it took about 15 years of building this brand, WO, which is short for Wysokie Obcasa, which means high heels, which 20 years ago seemed like a very good name for a feminist brand. Today, not so much. But after 20 years on the market, this has become the most powerful and well-known, well-respected women's brand in the country. There are now three generations of women who read this title in common, share it over their, um, over breakfast on the weekend, discuss its content. Um, they are occasionally very controversial topics. We had menstruation on the cover, the year of menstruation. We had, there's an ongoing debate in Poland about abortion and Wysokie Obcasa have been very uh, strong in taking uh, a clear political stance in this issue, which has driven a lot of discussion, a lot of, a lot of very heated was to take this maybe five years ago. Uh, my job was to take this brand and this content and create a community around it online. And we were very successful in doing this because the brand is magnetic. It's such a powerful entity um, on the Polish market that women online flocked to it. So there are nearly 300,000 uh, readers on social media. And um, when we were when we were experimenting with the different ways to engage with our readers online, um, the chief, the publishing director of Gazeta Wyborcza came to us and said that um, Google DNI fund was making money available to publishers with innovative ideas. And he said, listen, I don't think anybody has a title like Wysokie Obcasa in all of Europe. You are very unique. Is there something that you would do if you only had the money? And absolutely across the board, what our response was, we want to take this international because we in Poland have become so accustomed to having a title or a place online where we can go to whenever we want to know what women think about uh, what, what is happening in politics in environmental issues, whatever the discussion in Poland is, we only have to click on Wysokie Obcasa and we know how it affects women and we know what women think about it. Um, women in other countries, not only in Europe, but around the world, very rarely have the same resource uh, available. So that's where the idea for News Mavens came from. It's a concept um, based in Europe um, where women editors from news organizations in different countries belonging to the EU or soon to belong to the EU contribute what they think should be on the front page of their newspapers. Now, this is important because I believe that gender shapes our experience of the world and um, in very important ways directs attention to certain issues more than others and are convinced that when women are not made um, are not empowered to participate in decisions about what gets reported on and what doesn't that certain important issues uh, don't make it into the mix that there are stories that don't get printed and issues that are not discussed. So News Mavens is a place where if you are in such a newsroom where I, where stories that women consider important are not making it to the front page, and by front page I mean proverbial front page, you know, these are the stories that get the most attention, that get promoted, that get followed up, that get the most, um, that get the most leverage from the news organization. 
So if you're a woman and you see that stories you think are important are not being given this kind of prime real estate, um, then you can recommend that story to news mavens and we will promote it. So it started out as a roundup and Dean, you were correct. Um, we launched in September of 2017 with generous funding from Google DNI and Agora. We are now 27 women from across, from all regions of Europe, North, South, East, West. And we create a roundup and increasingly uh, original content and more news magazine content centered around women's issues. Um, that being said, I think there, um, I think there's, there's, an, there's one more story from Viborcha, from Gazeta Viborcha that is worth sharing. And that is that um, we now have, we have a very unique leadership structure in Gazeta Viborcha. Because the founding editor, uh, Adam Michnik, the guy who actually made the newspaper happen, um, because he's still with us, he remains the editor in chief. However, um, he is not that involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the newsroom. And what we have in place, which I believe works in other newsrooms as well, is there's this layer of three deputy editors who share uh, the responsibility of the day-to-day -day operations between them. And for many years, there wasn't a single woman among them. And you can imagine how um, exasperating and frustrating that was to the the Sokyovtsasa team. And now one of the main one of the main three editors as of two years ago is a woman. And that has brought with it a cascade of changes that has um, really helped to modernize and revolutionize the entire organization. And I, this is not to say that um, she brought all the innovation. Ola Klich is a fantastic editor and has um, wonderful skills that she's brought to the table, but she was the tipping point. When she was led into top management, all other changes started to become less, started to become more possible. And she has been um, the patron saint of a lot of changes that our previously, you know, paper first organization has been in dire need of for many years. And having observed from the balcony the process of transforming this organization, I've put together some, some tips um, and very simple techniques to help you move the dial on making women more welcome and giving them greater space to influence your own organization. And what I would, um, what I what I think is important is that we look at culture, and we start there, because there's a lot of formal uh, things we can do that will make the gender diversity situation in our organization appear um, appear balanced when in fact it will remain toxic for women if we don't make changes to the way that our organizations function and are run. Very, this, like many old industries, our industry used to be almost exclusively male. Um, minorities and women have made it into or the organizational structures of newspapers on, in, in most countries and have made it almost to the top. However, when you look at the statistics and there's a great, um, there's a great resource out there, um, the International Women in Media Foundation does a global report and they examine newsrooms in every country in the world and they compile statistics. This is really um, great to dig through. And what you will see uh, when you open up this report is that women are in fact making it 
as journalists. Women are also making it as editors. However, where they're not represented well enough yet is in the management structure and particularly in the leadership of newsrooms. Currently, when you average um, your, the when you average the stats in Europe, meaning that you are including the fantastically equal stats from Scandinavia, you still we still arrive at only 27% uh, of European newsrooms that are being run by women. And this, I believe, has an impact on the way we report and talk about the world around us. I think there is, uh, as I as I mentioned before, I think women gravitate and have been habituated and culturally um, encouraged to pay particular attention to certain areas more so than others. And news mavens so far confirms that the stories women are choosing to recommend to our platform, they deal with social justice much more than they deal with um, the, the the party politics and the the power players in big finance, big politics, big business. So instead of looking at what decision makers are doing, I'm finding that the women in the News Mavens collaboration are paying much more uh, attention to the effects of their decisions of decision makers' policies, the effects that they're having on real people on the ground. So what is happening after the decisions are made? What are the consequences? How are people dealing with it? What problems are, there, are they facing? And I think we can all agree that a balanced newsroom that not only um, focuses on what decision makers are doing, but also shows the effects of that work is the ideal newspaper which is servicing not only which is not only serving as a watchdog but is also uh, bringing needed attention to problems and needs facing our communities so i do believe that moving the dial on this 27 percent and nearing it to equality is an issue worth talking about however the good news is and I, I want to make this very clear, is that we don't have to get to 50 before the situation starts to balance. I, I attended this really cool conference in uh, Amsterdam uh, two years ago. It was, women, it was the first European Women in Tech conference. And there was uh, the, the director of Vodafone Italy is a woman. And she was there and she was talking to the audience about what Vodafone had done to repair their um, their gender equality issues. As you know, technology companies have been making a concerted effort to right the scales on gender diversity for the past few years, and Vodafone was one of them. And what they decided is that they would make parity a requirement in all new hires, meaning you had to hire an equal number of men and women, particularly into upper management positions, hire or promote. Um, but the decision was not to do this as a permanent fix. Now, I tell me, I don't remember whether she said they decided to do this for five or seven years, but there was a deadline. The idea was not to introduce parity forever. The idea was to bring that number of women in upper management up to 30%. I wrote here that 30 is the new 50. Because what happens once, when, once whatever minority group we're talking about reaches 30% is that they become big enough and strong enough to grow without assistance, without top-down um, special treatment or special care from, um, from whatever structure they're functioning in. They are capable of self-sustaining and growing on their own after 30%. So what that means is, as Europe, um, we don't have a long way to go. But perhaps, as individual newsrooms, we need to pay more particular attention to how far we are from this 30%. Um, I have a quote here 
and you, you will see this in my slides that I've included uh, links to resources that I think you might find helpful. There's this, there's this great article um, about women in politics that talks about why 30% is so is such a key um, milestone. And what they discovered is that when there's when there's more than one, see, one of the problems that a lot of organizations have is they, they think, oh shit, we're far from gender equality, let's do something quickly. And then what they do is they find the most qualified woman on their teams and they promote her to a management position, usually HR. And then they leave it at that. They have one and the job is done. And the thing about having one woman in an all male team is that she will conform and try to play by the rules set by the majority. That's not just a woman man thing. It's 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 a phenomenon often described as groupthink. It's also a survival mechanism um, and something that can only be fixed when your particular type of person has at least a 30% representation. Once you have when, once there's three of you as opposed to one in a 10 person group, you are able to more confidently express what is truly your both your management style, what you think the priorities ought to be, and what you think the solutions you could introduce um, should make it to the table. Before that, when you're in the minority, there's this psychological uh, rank issue that makes most people who are underrepresented keep quiet so as not to lose their place at the table at all. The other thing that I think would be very useful to look at once you've identified how many women are in your management structure and assessed whether how close you are to 30%. Another thing you, you might want to look at is um, not just making sure that no woman is alone in a management team, but looking at the culture of the way ideas are expressed and the way conversations are had. Because we have um, an issue with this um, in Western culture, it's called mansplaining usually, um, and it's expressed in, in a variety of ways. There are, there are two ways um, that, this, that this usually happens. One is when a woman be, makes a point or shares an idea or an argument, and then a man chimes in and restates exactly what she said in a more confident way, in a louder way, perhaps using, um, using more expression. And often the conversation launches from this guy's reiteration of a woman's idea. This happens all the time. It's not a consequence of, of uh, conscious disrespect. It's a pattern that happens so often starting from preschool and throughout education, throughout politics and public discourse that we're most of the time, we are not aware of it. So becoming aware of it and bringing the credit back to the original author who brought the idea to the table is a very simple way of changing an old habit that is actually destructive in getting women on who are currently on your team to make equal contributions. And there's there's a really fun tool you can use um, also during whether it's meetings or brainstorms or conceptual strategy meetings, um, because other than reiterating what women have said in a louder, more confident way, there's also just a, a, a pure question of proportions. Men tend to speak more, whether or not they have something um, value, they have something more valuable to say than women is up to you to decide you know your team best. But what we have um, what we have noticed is that there there is a domination of male voices in most conversations. And I didn't think this was true on certain, once you get to a certain level of, I don't know, responsibility and experience in an organization, I was certain that these kind of habitual um, conversation patterns would no longer hold true. 
And that's when I was um, introduced to this tool, Are Men Talking Too Much? And it was actually at, um, at a Google conference called Newsgeist. This is a closed invitation only conference for change makers within the European news industry. And there was um, a woman there from an investment fund that supports independent media in Holland. And she began using this tool to record the proportion that men and women were speaking during this conference. And this was a very peer conference. There was very high level people there. There were women there who were both CEOs and top managing editors and publishers and men who were of equal rank. And Google is very good at composing these events so that there's an equal gender representation. So everyone was equally powerful, educated and experienced enough to participate equally in the conversation. And yet, when Nenika used our men talking too much, she found that 70% of the conversation was being dominated by men. And what was really interesting is what happened when she shared this information with the people in the room. Because what happened was there was a collective gasp because most of the time when we talk about bias, we assume that everyone else is biased, but certainly we are not because we care about these issues, because we're involved with them, and therefore we cannot ever conceivably be guilty of actually being biased ourselves. So when this crew of people who I have a doubt, who have a proven dedication to gender equality discovered that actually they were repeating this, these very destructive patterns, just realizing that this was happening was enough to change the way the rest of the conversations happened during the rest of the conference. Men became more conscious of taking up space and women became more uh, determined to share their ideas because they were made aware of the discrepancy in their contribution patterns, which I think is a, is a very powerful thing. It's worth trying. Um, the link below will take you to the internet version of this application. And there's also a downloadable app for your phone to make it that much easier during meetings. And the second uh, step, I think, to moving the dial on gender diversity in the newsroom is to have a look at the content. And the one of the ways we did this in Gazeta Viborcha was we have this um, Every day, a different journalist from within the organization um, talks about what the other newspapers uh, wrote that day. Talks about, it's like a, a review of today's edition of our own paper and an overview of what the other media in our country are writing about. And one day when it was my turn to do this, um, I introduced a very simple me metric which I want to share with you today. What you do is you just audit, you gender audit your front page. And the way you do this is you look at photos, bylines, and experts quoted, and you check how many women are actually mentioned on the cover of your front page. And what was, uh, what was interesting here is I did the count and I think out of 16 people mentioned on the front page, as you see, they can be really, um, really thick with information. Out of the 16 people mentioned, whether they were, you know, experts quoted in the stories or journalists who'd written the, or, or women or people in the caption or in the photos, there was only three women. And at first, the um, the the editor, the deputy editor of Gazeta Viborcha, who was running the meeting, was very dismissive about this metric. It's like, oh, what could this possibly, what could this possibly matter? It's just today. But what happened was, it, it happened to be the woman editor who was running the meeting. And I didn't press the issue. I went on to discussing the other, the other newspapers. But at the next meeting that I came to, I found that she was doing the counting herself. Just being made aware that you can use this metric to gauge where you are and the equality of your reporting becomes it's because it's so simple um, and because it's so easy to use it becomes 
um, at first out of curiosity and later out of habit and conviction, it becomes an interesting metric to help your newsroom make change. So today, we almost always count the women on the front page, and we have not gone below 45% um, since the first day I introduced the metrics. We've done really well. The other thing is to, um, oops, the other thing is to become more aware of gender stereotyping in our own reporting. And this is a really, this is a really simple way. Do you see the picture of Angela Merkel and her, her neckline? It, it really made, um, it really made a lot of news and is just an example of how, regardless of whether a woman is in politics or in business or is an expert or is an author, there are certain habits that ma mainstream media has when talking to women like this, when interviewing them. And um, this is most recently discussions showed how clearly this also affects women in sports. And so the, the five cardinal sins, the things that um, make it difficult for women to be treated as equals and to have an equal shot is focusing on their domestic life. How are you going to be able to balance your mothering and your politics? Attaching uh, women to powerful men. This is something, that, an example of this would be when you talk about Amal Clooney, who is this fantastic human rights attorney, and after uh, after her bio, or in in her bio, in the in the first few sentences, you mentioned that she's actually married to George Clooney, and a lot of um, a lot of mass media will consider him the more important, more recognizable um, celebrity, and therefore will promote her by attaching her first and foremost to him. This is done also in politics and business. Um, it's also used to legitimize women who are high up by mentioning men who support them. Um, discussing women's emotions, their looks, and commenting on the shrillness of their voices. These um, very stereotypical ways of writing about women can be easily rooted out of any newsroom by introducing two very simple rules. If you wouldn't ask the question of a man, do not ask it of a woman. If you wouldn't say it about a man, if you wouldn't comment his hairstyle, if you wouldn't comment his purse, if you wouldn't comment the birth of his granddaughter and question whether he will be able to um, function in office having just had his family uh, enlarged by a new baby, if you wouldn't say it to a man, don't say it to a woman. And in general, leave women's private lives out of it. These two simple rules are really, because there's just two of them and because they're pretty intuitive, they can be brought, they can be very easily brought into the editing culture of most organizations. There's examples of how these five ways of stereotyping women have played out, particularly in politics. I found them in a great piece on this fantastic website called The Conversation, and you will be able to read more of them if you follow this link. I was told to run to about 3.40, so I'm four minutes over. I was really interested in hearing um, about relevant experience from your own news organizations or talking about questions you may have. So looks like we have 15 minutes to do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Very good. We have a shy audience today. Questions are not trickling, but I have plenty, so hopefully I will, I will uh, spark some questions. Um, my first question about news mavens, I'm just curious what type of audience you have so far for news mavens? Mm. Well, that depends on what you're asking. We have a um, we have a very di geographically diverse audience, and this changes depending on um, depending on content. 
last week, our most shocking and most popular story was about the wolf pack, um, the, the group of young Spanish men who gang raped an 18 year old woman during the running of the bulls. They even taped themselves doing it and shared it on their WhatsApp group uh, where they called themselves the wolf pack. And they were charged with sex, sexual abuse, but not with rape. And one of their and one of their um, one of their attorneys was saying that they should not be um, punished at all because from what they could see on the video, the young woman was enjoying herself and that it was consensual. And this story has enraged women in Spain and caused a lot of um, a lot of supportive protests around the world. And so, on a week when we have a story like this that gets thousands of hits, um, we see that there is a large number of readers from Spain, um, followed by the UK. We have a lot of readers from from Italy um, and Slovakia. It really depends on what the big story is. We, of course, have a have an ample following from Poland, but it's really diverse from all over. Uh, from all over Europe. Yes, there is a dominance of women in our in our reader reader pool. Um, I don't know what other questions you might have. Is is uh, the you know the idea that uh, the narrative that has played out so far? Can you say that the the topics uh, in the news it's it's much different, or is it how how, how can you generalize that? Well, like I said, uh, there's a lot more um, social justice issues that um, that our curators are interested in. We have uh, a section on the site where we follow particular patterns or stories that get or topics that get reported on um, most often. And we get a lot about illiberalism because this is um, the strongest, most surprising political trend, and we have women reporting from Romania, from Hungary, from Slovakia, from the from Czechia, from Italy, from Austria, wherever there is an illiberal um, slant to a new party, or when whenever a politician begins to use, I don't know, or urbanized rhetoric, like blaming George Soros for the influx of immigrants into Europe, like an Austrian um, politician recently, then we get this pattern um, growing. So we follow these stories a lot. Um, in, a, in a very natural way, we also follow women's issues, whether it pertains to whether it pertains to um, re reproductive rights, or glass ceiling, or equal pay, or sexual violence, we get a lot of those stories. So if you wanna know what's happening with women in Europe um, with regards to these issues, join us. Um, we follow big, big picture politics, but not really, um, not really as passionately. There's a lot of attention to free media, independent media, to um, liberal democracy and to women's issues. That would, that, those would be the main patterns we see, but we, we get a lot um, also about religion and family related issues pertaining to the care of the elderly and demographics. Mm -hmm. uh, switching, switching to Agora, you, you mentioned on Gazette's uh, front page that there were, when you looked at it one day, was, there were only three uh, women on on the home page, more or less. Uh, so, does Agora or Gazeta have any specific targets in place? So, for example, um, editorially, that that they have any targets in terms of how many women sort. Contributors have to be so so many women. Do you have any of those no. sort of strict practices in play? No, we don't have quotas. Um, we don't have quotas. And I think that's because we have a pretty balanced, at this point, we have a pretty balanced uh, readership. Uh, there's a lot of women who are who follow Gazeta Viborcha. 
who are in the audience, mainly because Gazeta has always been really strong with the social with the social issues. Currently, there's a big um, campaign and series of stories supporting teachers and the ongoing teacher strikes. And because um, and because the Agora is also always supporting women when it comes to reproductive rights, whenever there's huge protests about changing the abortion law, um, Gazeta Viborcha is very clearly um, su supportive of women. And that has won Gazeta a strong female leadership. So there isn't a lot of pressure at this point to use quotas to steer um, steer the content. Now that Ola Klich is deputy after two years, she has made so many subtle and big changes that there are women very high up in all areas of the newspaper which maintain a natural kind of control of the of the gender balance. Can you say how that took place? And was that organically or was that some policy in terms of hiring? Were there any, I hate to use the word quotas, but were there some, some things that were in terms of for a position, say, look, we need to have this many people, you know, in these editorial positions or these management positions. Was there anything like that? Yes, there was a big disaster. <laughs> um, not only uh, the digital revolution disaster, which we're all dealing with, but when the current government took control in Poland, they made Gazeta Wyborcza one of their blacklist enemy organizations. And one of the ways that they uh, uh, have been trying to diminish the power and influence of Gazeta Wyborcza is by forbidding, banning all companies that have any degree of public funding from advertising. So not only are we losing paper sales and we're also we also lost simultaneously a big chunk of our advertising which was coming from state or partially state funded companies. So that was uh, that was free fall. And what that necessitated was a lot of difficult changes simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And when you have crisis, what that does it, is it opens up the, the way for change. Things that used to be set in stone become a lot more flexible. Things that used to seem impossible suddenly start to happen. And that was when Ola Klich was made deputy. For years and years of there being no woman in top management, she was promoted. And at the same time, Gazeta made the transition from paper first to digital first which was really hard because there were all these fantastic um, older men editors who'd been with Viborcha for so many years. And ultimately a lot of them ended up leaving the company. And in their place, there was suddenly a new generation of people who had a greater understanding of uh, digital strategy and the importance of digital. And among them, there was a lot of young women. So, because these restructurizing and these um, mass fires that Gazeta had to go through because of the circumstances, because they had to happen anyway, what management did is they used that to put into place some of the best practices that would have taken years to happen in ordinary circumstances. But because we were in crisis, they could all kind of jump into place at the same time. And these new people have been really a great part of Gazeta's success in building their digital subscription um, success over the last year, year and a half. And that's brought a lot of fantastic new energy and readiness and diversity to the team. Mm -hmm. I interviewed uh, um, a top executive at a very big European media company recently. and. She mentioned we were talking about diversity in in their workplace, uh, gender diversity specifically, and she was saying that they were surprisingly not up to uh, the standard. Um, and we talked a little bit about quotas, and but um, she said that they were trying to implement those. But what she emphasized and what you talked a bit more about was mentorship among uh, employees and women. Could you elaborate on that and what that can mean? 
what type of mentoring? And can we, there, there's different types of mentoring. Um, and I'm not a huge proponent. I mean, I, I don't, I think mentoring is important and I think it can be helpful. But I believe that sponsoring is a greater tool for change in an organization. And by sponsorship, I mean actually when top executives, people in upper management on the board of directors and um, in the top tiers, when they actually go out of their way to promote a woman as she makes her way up the ladder in the organization. And there, are, I actually believe that it doesn't have to be a woman who promotes other women. It can be even more powerful when men do this. Mm. And I mean, you can't achieve gender diversity without including um, and relying on strong alliances from both sides. And when men promote women, this becomes a very powerful tool. And when women see other women on top, they stop doubting that they are capable of building their careers to that level as well. And I think ultimately that's a very strong message to be sending. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, going back to, to News Mavens, is, where, where does the project stand in terms of, uh, is this a long-term uh, project? Or is it? Well, we'll see, we'll see. We're, we just relaunched actually our front page. So this is why I'm so gun ho about showing that uh, showing our patterns section. And what the most surprising thing that we've learned because it it started as a question: What will happen to the news narrative if only women choose the news? And what we've seen happen is social justice, reproductive rights, minority rights, LGBTQ, illiberalism, democracy, and freedom of the press which has been fantastic. But what we've also seen is that the reaction of our readers who keep saying, wow, it's an all women newsroom. And we're like, no, 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 it's just a roundup. It's not a newsroom. And they're like, wow, it's an all women newsroom. And so it, it, for six months, I tried to re reconfigure our, um, our messaging so that people would understand that it's a roundup and not a newsroom. And it didn't work. I believe that sometimes when readers want something, they willfully refuse to accept that you're not giving it to them. And so I reconciled myself to the fact that News Mavens is now being conceived, uh, perceived as an all women newsroom, and we're actually going in that direction. And as of a few months, a few weeks ago, we started producing more original content. We're doing interviews, we're translating some of the great stuff that Vsokhya Ptasa have produced over the years, including this interview with Margaret Atwood about the various futures that she sees possible, like her critique of democracy and Donald Trump. Um, we've interviewed MPs from Hungary about illiberalism. We profile women who've made it to, or practically made it to the top of the political structure in their countries about what they learned and we're discussing anger and emotions and other things that women are told that they need to keep at bay because they're liabilities. And so we're really kind of exploring around the, um, the kind of core news uh, heartbeat that we developed. And that's where it's going. And whether it's long-term or not is really gonna depend on um, partners and readers. If they're willing to support th this project continuing after we run out of funding, then it will continue. And that's our goal. That's great. Okay, I'm going to give the audience one more chance here. Okay, you have a chance to ask uh, Susanna a question. All you have to do is type in a question on the right-hand side before we go here. We're, we're going to stay online because everybody's still here, interested. Uh, we're going to stay on just a few more minutes. Um, I, I will be at the one news summit, so I hope to, if you for, for whatever reason you don't want to ask your question now or you come up with one later, I will be in the Lisbon um, conference on the 6th of June, so I would love to meet some of you. Yeah. Yes, that, that'll be great. Uh, one last question from my side. Um, you mentioned earlier that, you know, this, the, I think it was in the conference of the, where the, 
they had the uh, the dude <laughs> the dude question or whatever and that when when the, the results came out that it was the conversation is being dominated that there was this gasp and that the the men reacted um if you think about going into you know your newsroom and, and Gazetta or somewhere else like that <clears throat> um in your experience how do you feel like men have been approachable in the sense of saying hey are you aware of this what are the what are the best ways to do that is there is there a organic approach to that is there something is there some sort of training that can be done is it going on i think in every country there's there's different resources so it's very difficult to say what universally can be done but i think um one of the things that is very unique about our industry is that we have these engaged and very intelligent co-workers and most of them do not have an intentional bias against women. What they have is uh, an unconscious bias and a permissive culture that has left women on the margins for so long that it's invisible to most of us until it's pointed out. And so I think the key is to not be accusatory and to not yeah. assume bad intentions on the side of the men that you work with, because mm -hmm. most of them do not intend to in disclude anyone, but they have been brought up um, to behave in a certain way and no one's ever told them that that is making other people feel unwelcome or unable to contribute. So being compassionate about how you share information and how you find space is one um, very important technique. And the other one is to not use it to draw attention to yourself. There is something about women being um, women who fight for their own recognition, their own pay equality, are often uh, perceived by people around them as being self-serving bitches. This is a very common uh, perception. However, if a woman stands up for another woman and uses her expression, her intelligence, her fighting power and her empowerment, to make sure that someone else gets the recognition that she deserves, that somebody else is treated equally, then that the, even though the issue is the same and even the arguments are the same, but when you do it on behalf of someone else, then you will be perceived better as a woman than if you do it to protect or help yourself. So those would be the two practical pieces of advice that I think are worth sharing. Oh, that's great, that's good. Okay, well, I think we have to wrap it up now. Susanna, thank you very much for uh, uh, attending and helping us out. It was very, very interesting. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you in Portugal for sure. Thank you so much. Me too. Th thank you, Dean. Yeah, and thank you to the audience uh, for everybody attending. Uh, just so you all know, we, will, um, we are recording this presentation, and we will put it on our YouTube channel. And we will share that with you in an email to follow up the webinar, as well as a summary of the webinar and ultimately a blog post. So thanks again for attending and uh, stay tuned for our next webinar. Have a great day. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.